Thanks very much. Now this 14th talk of mine is about a filmmaker called Hans Jürgen Seiderberg, who is not a household name and has to be said even within contemporary Germany. But uh, if there was a title for the talks, as there sometimes is at our meetings behind me, the title would have been Hans Jürgen Seiderberg, Lenny Riefenstahl there, question mark. Because there is a degree to which in these talks, I always try and find figures, occasionally, who are contemporaneous, who are alive and amongst us now, who are in this most difficult of eras, this most liberal, most democratic, most egalitarian of eras, the eras that are, in every sense, postmodern and after the crash, perceived in every possible way of 1945 and thereafter. Now, Cyberberg is a filmmaker who is possibly, at this moment in time, one of, if not the loneliest cultural figure in the modern unified Federal Republic. He's most famous for a film called Hitler, Ein Film aus Deutschland, made in 1978, which lasts seven and a quarter hours. <laughs> seven and a quarter hours. I saw it when I was 19 at the National Film Theatre. And it's one of those things where... Richard Nixon once said you needed a cast iron behind to read law, but you really needed uh, sort of some, some vitamin C anyway to watch this film for seven hours just physically. Because when you come out after having sat for that length of time, yeah. you really are uh, sort of rigid. Now, he's an East German essentially, and he was born in 1935 of minor aristocratic and upper class parentage. He lived in Rostock until 1945. He never was too young uh, to have gone through or had to go through the denazification process as a focused individual. But of course, he went through everything that happened later and indeed experienced the beginnings of the communist statement in the uh, occupied East. Cyberberg was always, and is, because he's still alive, although very elderly now, a controversialist in every sense. When he came west, there was a large reception for him from the cultural apparatus of the new federal West German state. And he made some equivocal remarks about the communist regimes of Ulbricht and Honecker. Uh, he talked about the fact that, you know, it's one of the first countries to build a wall to keep its people in. But at the same time, he said, they've managed to teach nearly all of us to read and write, which you over here in the West post-war don't seem to quite master. It was a slight pulling in of... Um, the welcome carpet, and people realised that Cyberberg was a man, in a sense, who said what he liked, and that isn't liked in contemporary Germany or most other countries. Now, he began with uh, a thesis on Durenmatt and the absurd, which seemed to chart him out for a regular academic, um, non-artistic career, but he always had a yearning for total art, for the total art form, uh, Wagner's vintage of the late, in the late 19th century, the Gestamtkunstwerk. Uh, my job is not very good, but the idea of a total form that combines all other speech, poetic higher speech, um, song, dance, movement, the, the visual image of the human and nature and the two together, uh, of narrative story, of action and drama, and so on. And when you think about it, film, and the use of film particularly by radical and authoritarian governments of the 20th century, is the total artwork for this era, as Lenny Riefenstahl knew and discovered and made use of, which is why she became the greatest female filmmaker of the 20th century, the most vilified, um, if you turn it around, cultural propagandist, as she was seen in that era, forbidden to make films in the post-war era. Interestingly, a couple of years ago... Um, uh, Mel Gibson was asked about her in the enormous brouhaha and controversy that blew up around his film, oh. The Passion of the Christ. And he said that he would have given her, you know, a few tens of millions, you know, because he's got that sort of money now, to make some of the films that she wanted to make, although she did make Teeth post-war. Now, 
This is because the amount of money that you need as a start-up production cost for films is so great prior to digital cameras coming on stream in the last five to eight years, say, now HD cameras and so on. But for small but very large amounts of capital, you can be completely stymied. And if most films before the internet, if you can't disseminate them, it's almost the, the vanity form of all vanity forms. And that's what faced her after the war. Now, Cyberberg's career began in, uh, with two very short films made in 1965 and 1966, respectively. One thing that he did is after the destruction, because although if you, can, you go to Germany today, and much of it looks like a you know, uh, poster tourist card, but that's because everything has been lovingly rebuilt, because it was smashed, not just a little bit, but to pieces, to atoms, uh, so that one brick hardly remained on another for north, south, east and west. Allied bombing, uh, primarily British bombing, smashed city after city after city. So there was nothing left, nothing left. Every urban area was like Grozny in Chechnya now, where I believe, even after the uh, present clique have been in for quite a few years, one street in the centre has been rebuilt. Now... He wanted to go back to many of the great actors and actresses who were then nearing the ends of their lives in the 60s and put them on the screen for the last time, a sort of addendum, a memorial, a thank you note. These, all these were all short films, um, shot on quite primitive equipment, black and white. The first one was called um, Romy Schneider, Anatomy of a Face. Rather unusual, a um, film about a woman's face. And it's a film about this uh, sort of great German actress beauty from the past. The actual bone structure was still there. And our whole film is essentially about her face. It's rather interesting, isn't it? Because there are certain modern theories about the contemporary face. Its weakness and its flabbiness <laughs> and its absence <laughs> of structure, you know? And that's what he's hinting at in that. Um, there's... Um, there's, there's somebody who people here know who was um, called in a small little group or sect and she was called the Countess and she was once asked about the face, the modern face and she made remarks like that and people were appalled but what Soberberg's doing by that very small idea is he's indicating that people didn't always necessarily look as the way they do today and the sensibility that they articulate is not that which says that 1945 is a year zero for us all, and there was nothing before, and we've all reinvented ourselves subsequently, and we're all postmodern and reflexive, and think every possible thought at every other possible instant. But in other words, there's something maybe classical that prefigures value. But it's a short film, and it didn't get too much attention. Then in 1966, he dealt with uh, Fritz Kortner, who was a very well-known actor, particularly a Shakespearean drama in German. He's very elderly then. And this is just scenes of him rehearsing, almost a radio film in a strange sort of way. He's going through motions. His great performance in German theatre was this Shylock. And Cyberberg has him, possibly in his last ever performance, because the point of film, as these elderly actors realise, is it memorialises them. Who who's remembers these people now? Mm. If there isn't the film there of them, and Courtney, as an old man, is quite clearly suffering with various illnesses that will take him away a year or two, or two after filming in '66. But he gets him to articulate this superhuman, stroke inhuman, scream of revenge, Shylock's desire for revenge against the Gentile world, a sort of primal scream. Remember in the '60s there was that cult called Primal Scream. You could go into your unconscious and draw it all out, you know, and get rid of it through a big scream. It's, it's, it's that cold in blast, you know. But it's being replaced by something else. Nevertheless, Cotton gets this scream in this film. And then it ends. And that's another little vignette for what's coming later on in Cyberberg's career. At this moment, he was just dismissed as a mildly academic eccentric, making some odd uh, revivalist films about previous German cultural figures. Inoffensive stuff. As we move on, the obsession with the the Romantic Movement in the 19th century and the Volkish Movement in the 19th century and their visual art and some of their religious ideas and they overlap into the, uh, into the Van der Vogel Movement 
of the 19th century, where large numbers of youth would move around the countryside. It was almost like an alternative society movement, much of which prefigured German involvement in the Foreign Legion, in paramilitary organisations, in the enormous volunteering across the German-speaking parts of Central Europe for the Kaiser's armies in 1914 and thereafter. And it's quite clear that this is the area of culture that Cyberberg wishes to concentrate on. To do, he did another famous documentary of Cosimo Wagner, which caused enormous problems for the Bayreuth Festival and enormous problems for her family, because he kept the microphone on after the interviews had left, but he did it with her consent, because the microphone's in front of her. And she talks, and she talks, and she talks. And then after a certain gap, she starts talking about Adolf Hitler. And she talked about Adolf Hitler for four hours without a break. And quite a lot of this found this into what would then be the final cut of the film. And the family went absolutely berserk when this film was distributed. And Cyberberg was blackballed. And he was never allowed to attend the festival again. And... Um, it was a scandal to a degree, although the scandal was slightly undercut by the fact that he was regarded as a, as a revealer of everything, of something that had been widely known anyway. In other words, that she was extremely um, sympathetic, but also that he, Hitler had once told her that Wagnerism was his religion, or the nearest that he ever came to one. Now, Hitler cost £100,000 to make in 1978 or 77, prior to its release in 78. You can get it on the internet. It takes ages to download because it's seven hours and therefore most people just give up. But it is there <laughs> up on the internet. And the BBC part financed it, which is truly extraordinary in certain respects. But this is because of the disjunction between Western German culture and the rest of the West, even the rest of the NATO West, of which West Germany was indisputably a part, at that time, and not just East Germany, not just the Germany that existed before the collapse and destruction, but the difference between, say, the Anglophone world within the West and Germany proper, however defined in the multiple ways I've just delineated. So, from the English BBC sort of viewpoint, the Germans were living an unmastered past. No one would talk about this material. Here is a man who's prepared to make a virtually eight-hour film about it. Therefore, give him some money, £50,000, quite a lot of money in the 1970s, oh. but not an unbelievable amount for a state broadcaster. And it's true that in the 70s, very few people would deal with any of this material at all. Indeed, he was so short of actors that in the final sequence, the fourth quarter, is divided into four pillars, four sections, we children of hell is the fourth one. Puppets appear. And when somebody asked him why he used puppets, he said, well, I run out of actors. <laughs> so, now, the thing about this film is it's quite visually extraordinary because it's based in one set. Um, if you've ever seen Derek Jarman, for, uh, Jarman's film Caravaggio, which is in Latin, it's set in one set, which of course means that from a cost basis, you can keep cost to an absolute minimum. And you can also perhaps film for a month, seal it up, three months later you come back, and in some respect everything's still in situ. Now, I think it's Paul Langlois, the uh, French set designer, had a lot to do with the set, uh, because it's noticeable that a lot of back projection is used, because it's a very theatrical film. And for a long time, it was treated as essentially an avant-garde and a modernistic film, because it's not narrative-based, it's episodic, it's slightly mannerist, it superficially appears to be very anti, whereas its real crime is neutrality about matters that you can't be neutral about, not in the contemporary uh, or postmodern Federal Republic. Aesthetically, the uh, Cyberbirds in love, um, not with a particular government between 33 and 45, but with the aesthetics from which it originated. He's a sort of Germanic race soul artist, really. Um, of that sort of yearning, transcendental and instrumental spirituality which he sensed uh, the Germans as possibly the primary, central, <coughs> originating European character reference possesses. And he wants to go to those areas 
that contemporary Germany has cast us off limits to most of its artists and writers since the war. Why is this important? It's important because, as Esther Pound said, uh, genuine creators are the antennae of their entire populations. If you want to find the contemporary art that's art in the broadest of senses, but I mean creation that has a social dimension. If you want to find that in a society that's deracinated or broken down or self-questioning, doubts everything about itself, doubts everything about its past, which is why it doubts its present moment, and so on, you'll find the sort of art that's epitomised by something like the Turner Prize. Whereas if you look at the sort of art that he's dealing with, you see a more communitarian, more organic, more restorationist art, art that's closer to contemporary, uh, to representational fantasy in the mind and beyond it. Dream is extraordinarily important to Seidelberg, um, because he believes that, in a sense, the real truths are deeper than reason, which is why he is a quasi-religious artist, whatever his actual statements about religion may be. We know quite a bit about his actual views, something that many artists don't put on record either because they don't have them in a formal way, or because if they do, they reveal too much and it's difficult to get funding and this and that. Because he wrote a book in 1990 called The Fortunes and Misfortunes of Artists in Germany After the Second War. Now this is a remarkable book, but we need to discuss Hitler in detail before we come on to it. The film uh, stars an actor called Heinz Schubert, it also stars Cyberberg himself in the fourth quadrant and his own daughter, various puppets and minor figures. The first section deals with Hitler's personality cult. The second section deals with Volkish Romanticism in the 19th century. The third section deals with the Shoah, particularly as it's seen from Hitler's perspective. The fourth section deals with the aftermath and the generation who feels it with incredible acuteness because Cyberberg's generation mentally comes of age in the immediate aftermath of these events. So for them, the year zero for Germany is the beginning of adult consciousness with an occupied society that's divided hemispherically in accordance with the two world blocks and hyperpowers that then exist. There is a collection of short stories um, written by a young German who died relatively soon after the war called Wolfgang Borsche, um, which Calder published in the 1960s. Is, is, I think it's Germany in the Ruins, something like that. And it's largely the stories of people scampering about to survive, living in cellars, shooting rats. Uh, there's no water, uh, there's no electricity. During these three years, between 45 and 48, about at least 2 million Germans died during that period because there was very little food. Uh, parts of the Morganfeld plan were implemented in certain sections of American zone of occupation. Other American commanders were completely opposed to that plan and subverted it. So it was a mixed picture. But nevertheless, at least according to the contemporary German historical record, 2 million Germans perished during that time. Nearly always the people Liberals say they came most about the weakest, the illest, the oldest, women, children, the infirm, and so forth. Now, Seidenberg's mental for space of reference, if you like, in terms of maturation, his immediate pre-adult to adult beginnings is that. And yet, he is a dainty realist and a luscious romantic of the most extreme and German type in a way that almost strikes the slightly ironic attitude that the English still always partly have to things as very Teutonic, almost overbearing in its seriousness, the seriousness of its sort of pietistic romance. At the end of his career, his last major fictional film was a Wagner's op uh, opera Parsifal with an extraordinary performance um, as the female lead Kundry in that opera. But back to Hitler... The first section involves all sorts of scenes, some taken from circus and vaudeville, some drawing on Weimar culture, some drawing on what inevitably replaces it, use of dolls, use of sets that are lit in red, uh, use of a lot of flame, 
use of a lot of sort of occultistic, thula, <coughs> gothic imagery to create a sort of sensibility for that, n the nature of a German biological romanticism, really, quintessentially a Central European artistic sensibility, which has been completely voided, completely voided in the post-war dispensation. Sauerberg has become almost a cultural unperson, although people know he's there and he lives as an old man in contemporary Germany and so on, because he's gone back into the area that that movement originated from. It's not that that movement in some ways is the culmination of that area, but it comes out of it. The dilemma that Seiberberg has is he's not a politician, he's not a political partisan, he's a German partisan. He's a partisan for German culture. And therefore his perspective is you cannot have German artistic culture with this voltaic energy, this storm center, this sort of condenser battery removed from the circuit. The energy, even to rebel against it, of what it is to be German, comes from this vortex. Therefore, to disprivilege it is to cut it out completely. It's like Elizabethan tragedy without uh, the example of the Greeks in the past, or Seneca as a sort of in la Roman version that Shakespeare was aware of. You have to have that primary fodder, that primary material, fuel, upon which to feed. And if you can't have it, because it's denied you in a particular era, then you can't express nationally what you are. And this is the real thesis of this film, which people saw in the 70s and thought, uh, oh, interesting critique of the fact that Germans won't mention their past by a fringe German director. That's how it was first regarded. That's why the BBC used to show it, insofar as you show things extensively when they're over seven hours. But I remember... Um, you know what Christmas Day is like, you know, when you get sick of your relatives. Uh -huh. So you go into another room and watch the film on BBC Two. Mm -hmm. And I remember in 1980 watching Simon Bird's Hitler for seven and a half hours on a grainy black and white set. And, you know, it was quite extraordinary in all sorts of ways. The second section also has a significant potted filmic history of German 19th century art added in, fair pictorial art, added into the general mixture. Um, if anyone logs in onto Cyberberg's site, he's got several, and there's a significant Wikipedia entry concerning him, which details all the controversies that have engulfed him. Uh, the first section is Cyberberg, interesting and provocative German director. Uh, the second section is Cyberberg's films. The third section is comparison and criticism. The fourth section is controversy, dash, the danger of anti-Semitism. So you can see the, uh, uh, the chronology as it sort of goes down. Uh, but there's links to his sites and to your ability to, if you've got the patience or the machinery, so to do, download Hitler a film from Germany. One of his more outrageous his ideas is that the entire experience to so somebody born and me, uh, who comes culturally of age, he's mentally born, if you like, uh, just after it, is so extreme, is so devastating, that his way of dealing with it is to internalise it and view it as a film. Mm -hmm. That's why he calls it Hitler, a film from Germany. So he actually sees the past as a film. Now... Many people, particularly people who are not particularly artistic, would consider this to be either a non sequitur or a disprivileging of reality or the sort of thing artists do to cope with life or whatever. But in actual fact, for somebody such as him and his sensibility, it's because he privileges these things more than anything else, that he's prepared to make a film of them. Make, because he has essentially a spiritual view of art, he doesn't see it as a money-making exercise or a trivialisation or a fake authentication or something to do with one's time between birth and death or an attempt to sort of uh, please others or gain cubists from oneself. He actually sees it as a sort of spiritual and moral transcription. The third uh, section is very interesting because this is about the shower, which is totally accepted as a fact in this section of the film for which there is no apology. 
And this is the interesting thing, thing about it, that it's dealt with in a tone and in a briskness that's almost identical to the way um, Menachem Begin describes the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in his autobiography, which is um, called My Life, I believe, <laughs> uh, just like Sartor Mosley's. And um, when asked about these events, Begin said we did what we had to. Let there not be talk of morality. There is only the necessity of action and vigour. That's it. No more talk. And that's the sort of attitude that you get in that third section. I think a few worrying bells went off when that section was seen. But because it's not in any sense revisionist or even pre-revisionist, it's, it's, it's again the, the view that you get subliminally from that section is that if Germany is to ever have a future, it has to master his view, filmically nonetheless, of the consequences of these events. In some ways, he's preaching what Nietzsche called self-overcoming, whereby you say yes to life, you accept even the most unpleasant things, you absorb them just as you absorb rubbish and trash in a fire, you step over it to other things and to other glories. It's the creative use of destruction or the refusal to be imprisoned by the consequences of the destructive urge seen as part of the human potentiality. In other words, it's a non-dualist view of morals, an explicitly non-Christian viewpoint, but not belabored as such. In the fourth section, uh, We Children of Hell, he talks about, with his daughter, and Heinz Schubert, he remains ubiquitous as a varied sort of presence and trickster, wearing multiple hats and playing multiple parts, including Himmler, throughout the film. Cyberbird talks about the legacy of what it means to be German in the modern world. The interesting thing is that this film deals very bluntly and very explicitly with the fact that for almost everyone outside Germany, outside, um, since 1945, whenever a German is presented to them, the almost, almost implacable urge is to ask them about these events. I remember I was at a, some party or something when I was about 18 and some German student turned up and various people made a beeline for them and the first thing that they were really asked of any substance beyond how they were and what the weather was was what's your view of what happened between 1933 and 1945 and of course most contemporary Germans want to get, make money they want to get away from as much of that as possible they want to redefine the nature of who and what they are and so on they don't even want to discuss it Simon Berg's, in a sense, going straight for that heart of darkness, in Conrad's sense of the term. He's going straight there, without equivocation, uh, but artistically, because he knows that if you don't, in a sense, bring this material to the surface, art in post-war Germany, in other words, morally truthful creativity, is impossible. You see this in many careers, actually. Look at the famous leftist to green novelist Gunther Grass, who seen as an anti, seen as um, a sort of uh, said the left stalwart of the uh, Adenauer um, post-war government and so on then it's suddenly revealed, almost right at the end of his cultural trajectory as he's coming to an end, almost the last ball, that he served for a fraction of a time when he was a youth, he had no choice but he served in the uh, Waffen SS and how this has almost led to a perspectival altering, not just of one book or one incident when he was a late teenager, but of his whole career. In other words, truly, the unmastered past. Because, bluntly, this is what Cyberberg has been dealing with since the very beginning, not the end where it's sort of looked back on when you've written a shelf load of books to prepare for the moment, but as the first step to dealing with the possibility of the last moment. Now, the film had a reasonable success and was shown in art cinemas all over the world. It was shown in the extensively in the United States, where it was seen uh, as an elegy and an indictment, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Susan Sontag wrote extensively about it. She wrote an essay called Fascinating Fascism, which is largely based on that film. And she, um, uh, Paul Lacan-Lemart, a reasonably well-known French critic, he also wrote a review of it. 
Um, it seemed reasonably successful, far too artistic and obscure for many people. Um, some of the German is very complicated and the translation terse and so on, although the English language version isn't too bad because the BBC got some expert German linguists in because they half financed the thing in the first instance. Now, after Hitler, he moved on to do this film of the Wagner opera, which again is an attempt at what Brecht would call epic theatre. And also, what Wagner had wanted by the idea of total art and high opera, which obviously would have lent itself to the idea of total film, total theatre, total art. Brecht had the concept of epic theatre, and so have always been very pro-Brecht, not ideologically, but because it's the desire to make great statements that are great German statements. Indeed, his views of Brecht were quite unfashionable once Brecht went east and became almost, you know, the sort of privileged puppet master of the Berlin Ensemble, and, well, they all said they were oppressed and made to do it now, <laughs> but in actual fact, of course, they loved every minute, and he had his own chauffeur, private flat, private public flat, guards, limousine, you know, the whole works. But he went to the East and did a film about Brecht and his legacy because he was a great German. Again, you will sense that equivocal element in Cyberberg, as well as the pride of an Easterner as well. Because as we all know, there is a distinction between the East and West German sensibilities which has been exaggerated and exacerbated by the fractured nature of their experience in the post-war period. Even politically today, there's a disjunction between the amputated limb of the East that's been put into sort of right. cyrogenic storage and repositioned back on the rest of the trunk. Now, Cyberberg's opera of Passover is a truly extraordinary opera. It can be obtained on Amazon and so on for very small amounts of money now. Um, that opera, which essentially preaches not just total love, but total redemption through love and the creation of a Germanicized Christianity, a sort of Deutsch-Deusized Christianity in many ways, um, is a chance for Cyberberg to luxuriate, his critics would say, fetishistically wallow in Germanicism and in culture of deep linguistic romanticism that is outside politics, but types of extreme politics grow from it. The thing about his type of work is that there is no distinction, as there usually is, between political statements, aesthetic statements, ideological statements, philosophical ones. They're all merged into, if not a total attitude towards the world, sort of belt of shank, but a total attitude towards art, because for Cyberbank, art is the world. Um, it's the view that it's more important than the creativity of that level, it's more important than life and death, which to most people is just sort of high fleeting nonsense. But uh, Cyberberg sort of believes in it with a passion, and this has made him, particularly with the, the material that he wishes to deal with, very, very unfashionable. After about 1990, he found it increasingly difficult, certainly in the Federal Republic, to raise money to make films. Uh, possibly he'd come to the end of his trajectory, he made a film about Carl May, made a film about uh, the Barker family, made a film about Duke II, made a film of Wagner's opera Parsifal, made his enormous film Hitler, did these shorter films when he was younger. He was in a philosophical narrative-based and yet largely linguistic film, where people discussed their ideas, including some famous elderly German actors called The Easter, which was made in 2004, and he has a producer uh, role in that, and a performance role as one of the philosophical spokesmen. Since then, he's done not very much, apart from all being allowed to do too much in film, which always costs money, if you're going to have it disseminated with any public prominence beyond the internet. He published this book, however, in 1990, which I've always already referred to, called The Misfortunes and Fortunes of uh, an Artist Born in Germany After the Second War. This created an enormous cultural war, as they're called, into Germany at the time. It's largely forgotten now, but not by some of its protagonists. 
um, many people who were associated with Cyberberg until they dropped him after that, and he became a little bit of an unperson. person. <coughs> During this book, he says that um, Germany is um, essentially culturally, contemporary Germany, it's essentially culturally rotten, and has destroyed itself, and is self-hating, and uh, ironically in relation to everything connected with the past, is uh, philo-Semitic. Excessively so. And this is, uh, this is not really it for him, I think. Uh, I remember Michael Walker of Scorpion magazine, who had, I think, become a German citizen by then, writing in one issue of that publication that uh, Cyberberg better know what he's doing, because uh, uh, the way things are going, um, he won't be making too many films in the future. Now, Cyberberg's politics is less important than the spirituality of the artistry that he represents. As with all visu extremely visual artists like him, describing what he's done, it makes a lot more sense if you've actually seen the material. But of course, very few people are entirely aware that this material exists, even though uh, quite a lot of that and comes up on the internet almost instantaneously in English. But the reason for this is because people understand what he is doing. He's positioned himself to be the repository of the sort of sensibility which didn't come to an end in 1945. There are certain forms of German classicism that are not particularly relevant of it. There are certain forms of German medieval art that don't really relate to it. Um, there's something rather trans-German and quasi-Catholic and German in the European sense, in Nietzsche's sense of uh, being European as against German about him. There's not very much Protestant, in my view, about his art aesthetically, for example. But he is the repository of the romantic, volkish sensibility, which people know is quintessentially German, and yet is largely denied, apart from tourism and a few pretty things now, but it is ideologically denied in contemporary Germany. What's wanted are endless novels of guilt and expiation and anti-romanticism and existentialism and writers like Michael Walser and Robert Walser and Elias Kinetti's auto defy and this sort of thing, you know. We've destroyed ourselves and we've deserved it. This sort of stuff. Endlessly. This is what's wanted. Needed. Required. Um, expiation before the possibility of a primary statement. Even before the possibility of a primary statement. It's the sort of Angela Merkel sort of... Um, uh, never be proud to say that you're German without an enormous preliminary screed that almost has to be read out of apologetics before you can even get to the moment that you enunciate in a quiet voice. Now, the truth is you can't create anything in a culture without that element of fire in the belly and without that element of prior authentication. After German unification, there were quite a few articles about Cyberberg. There was one well-known one by Daderich and, and Kamecki called Spiritual Reactionaries and their attitude towards the new German unification. Many people, of course, saw a great danger in the nationalisms, as in confused, although some of them were, that were released when communism was taken off. And there was lots of ink spilled in allegedly quality journals all over the world about the dangers of this and that. Um, so Cyberberg had his moment in his film, 19, in, in his book in 1990. It's also very important to consider his class position in a strange sort of way in post-war Germany. Um, the sort of Germany he came from, now his father managed a state on behalf of other people, partly related to the people who owned them, partly not. That type of class back then destroyed several times over, really destroyed by the collapse of the Second Empire, uh, finished off by the First War, any savings pretty much decimated by the inflation, which is probably why he was later, his father was managing other people's estates. Um, the Weimar period was a sort of a, an interregnum that he just got through. Then there was a quasi-authoritarian, semi-militarist governments between 30 and 33, then Hitler's chancellorship thereafter. Then the German world seemed to have come to an end with every city and every town in complete steaming rubble and uh, tens of thousands of corpses under the rubble. 
so that when the sun came up in the summer, there was an incredible stink of all the carrion. Because you know, first you had to get all the stone up, then you had to bury them in lime pits and that sort of thing. And this is before you could rebuild in accordance with what will be later called the German economic miracle, um, that which had been destroyed before. Everything is a sort of simulacrum, a version, a film, a virtual version, a virtual reality version of what existed. It's sort of it's Thunderbirds, you know, you blow it out, it's still there. Yeah. And that's why he sees everything as a film. That's why uh, the most outrageous thing of, thing of all, as Susan Sontag worked out long after she wrote, she wrote her essay, Fascinating Fascism, is that maybe he regards the Shah as a film. A film. A film from Germany. A film from Israel. A film from Palestine. A film from Germany. Which, if you like, of course, a film's a fiction. But it can be truer than fact. Yeah. And more important than fact. Like a great religion is more important than fact. Because it can move millions of human beings to behave in ways they would never do otherwise. One man with an idea and with certainty is worth 50 other men. So, when you look at the, the artistic basis and the methodological premises of his cultural practice, as contemporary Marxist cultural studies types would call it, you suddenly see that there's something actually slightly insidious to liberal order. But my view is it's less conscious than semi-conscious, in my opinion, of his work, because he's somebody whose total focus in life is artistic. In a very German way, he's totalitarian about art. In a way, someone like Otto Dix was, for example. You know, it's sort of, uh, it's that desire to, not just penetrate to the core in the way that the Elizabethans in our own dramaturgy would like to do, but to actually go to the limit of what is possible to, is what is possible to say in a given trajectory. And his style, trajectory, would be what Wikipedia calls the dark side, mm. the dark side of German Romanticism. Oh. Mm. Now, is he or can he at all be described as Lenny Reef and Stahl's heir? Firstly, the, the cinema that she made, the idea of uh, making anything comparable in post-war Germany is utterly unthinkable. Mm. It's unthinkable. Therefore, all that could ever be made is to approximate to the sensibility that she shows in her films as much before Triumph of the Will and Olympia, Parts 1 and 2, first of all of the peoples, as, the, as is congruent with those works themselves. The first films were mountain films and films of extreme Aryan wistfulness in the sort of ex permafrost of the ice. Uh, she was a dancer before then. The last film is about the serenity of the body and uh, opera, stroke operetta, and again a return to that which she knew best. When blocked, you go back. Always with her, you sense this um, yearning and transcendental idealism and a desire to attain archetypal perfection visually. She's an extreme visualizer and an extreme feminine visualizer, which is artistically unusual. And it's why Hitler chose her to make that film. In the teeth of all sorts of party opposition, Goebbels couldn't stand the idea initially that a woman would make the film, and was overruled. Because she viewed that movement with the, eye, with the religious eye, essentially speaking, of a female artist, which is why Hitler chose her. Because he wanted it seen in that way. And it's very rare for the male world, if you like, for an extreme version of part of the male world, to be viewed by the female artistic eye from without, uh, with technical ability of genius as well, editorially and so forth. This, I feel, is the comparison that can be made between him and her. But with him, likewise, there's a technical search for perfection, given monetary and budgetary limitations. And there's also a yearning idealism, which exists in many cultures, but I often quintessentially associate with uh, Germanic forms of art and with the German sensibility, without which north, south, east or west, there can't really be a centre. It's not that we're all Germans, really, although English people are primarily Germanic. 
But nevertheless, it's that they're the core to the European identity, which can have many outer chambers, but without the core, doesn't exist. And this is why the despite the fact that we technically fought against them savagely twelve times in the second in the twentieth century, that is actually less important, in my view, than the spiritual damage which has been done to Germany since the Second World War. And the degradation of Germany and of things German in casual British Parliament and much and American as well, and much more much more subtly and culturally than that. At every level, from the mass cultural levels and sort of graphic novels to um, modernist opera and back again, every level there has been this sort of attitude of not just cynicism or disrespect, but deconstruction and willed and vigorous and sort of emotionally uh, violent deconstruction of that. And unless Contemporary European people can, in the next uh, years that face us, step over that. There will be a hole right in the heart of the European identity, right in the hole of the Caucasian identity. Because our identity without German culture is essentially unthinkable. Without its art, without its literature, without its music, without its philosophy, without its at times, to the English spirit, ponderous seriousness, but at its fanatical attitude towards ideas, that streak of virulence that's part of the Germanic nature, and in which now they've taught, been taught to be afraid. And Cyberberg's work is an artistic attempt to wrestle with what it is to be German, which, if you think about it, being a German artist in the, or any sort of creator is not making schlock television just to sort of shift uh, you know, butter mountains. But he's actually trying to articulate a vision of life. There's no nationality in Europe, even in Russia under communism. There is more difficult, more difficult to do, or to bring off, or even to deal with, than the German identity. Because even the Bolshevik Revolution didn't so disprivilege the very idea of what it was to be Slavic or Russian. From the inside out, it destroyed and burned and blew up churches and destroyed artworks. Every, I think every musician that Shostakovich was at the Moscow Conservatoire with in one particular year was shot. Everyone on Stalin's orders. And when uh, he asked uh, through party officials, because you had to be a member of the party, of course, um, why he'd been spared, Stalin said, "As Shostakovich can write film music, we need film music because we need film mm. because with film we can go straight into the minds of the masses." There's this Polish novel called uh, "The Engineer of Human Souls," and that was a Stalinist term. We are the engineers of human souls. And we need men who can write the music for the films where we can go straight into the brains of the masses. Because with film, you can go straight into the front cortex. You go straight, because that's visualization does. Before you hear the sound, before you hear the music, you see the image. And the image has gone straight into the mind. That's why it's, it is the form of the 20th century. It's where representational art has gone in the 20th century. It's why radical governments have used it in every way. It's why the Chinese use film extensively with the masses. It's why, uh, but also, of course, in all other cultures, India as well, now coming up uh, economically. In the United States, the whole dream factory has been created since basically uh, so a consolidation of the Hollywood studios as an industry per force in around 1919 prior to creation by some of the artists uh, like D.W. Griffith or the United Artists. It's interesting, uh, just as a sideline in American cinema, to think of what's happened to D.W. Griffith. Films like Intolerance and, above all, Birth of a Nation, parts one and two. Um, the Golden Globe Awards and certain Hollywood Awards, up until the early 1990s, used to have a D.W. Griffith prize. Of course, for those who don't know, in Birth of a Nation, the clan of the heroes not a film that will be made today. 
And in the early 1990s, certain black nationalists complained. And the D.W. Griffith Prize, they didn't get rid of it at all because he's crucial to the development of world cinema with Lillian Gish in his major films and this sort of thing. So it's, you know, the Shakespeare of American cinema, it's a bit difficult to completely put him in the closet. But by this stage in time, to 10, 15 years further on, the D.W. Griffith Prize is no longer awarded. And that sort of um, Hollywood cinema, uh, which over time and at certain times has had certain genuine European features, and yet over time also has changed to the degree that the amount of European sensibility that's left in contemporary Hollywood is very small. Mm -hmm. The amount that was there in 1920, correspondingly, was quite significant. Indeed, there's always been many Hollywoods, and as um, Gibson discovered with his film, if you make half a billion dollars in personal profit, your criticism dries up. Well, John Wayne opposed racial desegregation. He gave money openly to the Klan in the 1960s. He was such a big star, he was left alone because yeah. he's a big brand, and you know you want them. But there's a degree to which. The sensibility that he represented, they just made sure it didn't appear on the screen too much. Mm. That's how it's done. And Cyberberg is not a right wing, in my view. In it. He's a conservative nationalist of a, of a mild sort. But he's an aesthetic German. And his real premise is that Germany is in all of us. And without its cultural inheritance as something to use and step beyond, we cannot have a coherent Europeanness. And without that trajectory, it is not possible to survive. So I would ask you, next time you've got an hour or so on the internet, to put Hans Jürgen Cyberberg into Google or one of the other search engines, and bring up what you can and see what you make of it because he's somebody who is obscure, but he's obscure not because he's no good, and not because he needs to be obscure or has been falsely kept so, but because he's slightly dangerous. And in this era of standardization and of dumbing down and of conformity, there, are great, there is a great need for those who are prepared to stand up for the inner lives of their own peoples. And he's still alive. Thank you very much.